So that led to engineering. And then, then it becomes, okay, what are the hard problems? What's a really hard problem? And a lot of the problems we face today in systems, they're really hard because the systems are really complicated. It's systems of systems of systems. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. Today's guest is a very special one for me. I'm joined today by Phil Atfield. Phil, you there? Uh, yes, I am. Good, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Oh, yeah, and whatever time of year it may be. You know, it's all blending into one these days, isn't it? Phil and I go way back, almost 30 years, I think, maybe more since we first met. And Phil, I think your first job out of college was for my father, right? That's correct. And my first job really out of college, except for the, the nonsense I did before that, was for you. And a small startup in Ottawa, where we did some really cool security things. And today, strangely enough, I thought about this the other day, I think I may have mentioned it to you. My dad works for you now, and I'm on your board for your new company, Sequitur Labs, which is kind of weird. But for me, I can't think of security without thinking of you. And so I'm, I'm super excited to have you on the show today. Great. Hey, thanks. Great to be able to join. Let's go back before security. You're an electrical engineer by training. And I think it's fair to say you're a tinkerer, period. As long as I've known you, you love to roll up your sleeves and take things apart and play. Is that fair? And if so, where did that start? It's very fair and it's very true. And it started when I was probably about five years old. And how? How did that happen? How? I call it just an innate curiosity of how things work, why they work. As a two and three-year-old, I drove my family insane, asking the question, why? I think you still do, by the way, just FYI. I still do that. It's this innit curiosity of wanting to understand why, how, and roll it forward. How did we get here? Why is it this way? And well, it shouldn't be this way anymore. Mm. You asked me a question once, and I have to mention it now because it just popped into my head. You asked me about seven years ago, you said, Sam, if you took a box full of the technology that we use to assemble all the stuff around us back in time, to like 1970, and you gave it to people, what would they build with it? Would they build the same things? And that question's come back to me over and over again. And I've thought about how we use technology and what we decide to do with it. And not always the best tech wins. But I have to ask you now, why did you ask me that question at that time? And how would you answer that question? If you take a set of parts, so I ask that question because we, you know, I look at a system, you take it apart, you figure out what's inside. And it's built the way it is today because of some temporal conditions. So Mm -hmm. the way we think about the system as it is today, if we go back, say, 10, 20 years, and you have the ability to still build that, those conditions exist, and would you do it? Yeah, in other words, it's situational. It's not inevitable that technology winds up in the sort of... Correct, correct. It's a combination of evolution and looking forward and trying to anticipate what is it this thing is supposed to do, and... If you went back, say, 20 years, is there even a need for that? Did you realize it? I mean, who'd have thought 40 years ago you'd ever have a PC? Or that we would use it for the things we do. Yeah, yeah. So going from at the one end of the spectrum, a five-year-old disassembling things, to that sort of the other end of the spectrum, we've got you questioning the direction of technology altogether. Somewhere in the middle, I know you're fascinated with components and systems and how they relate to each other. First of all, how did you get on the engineering path? And secondly, how did you get on the security path? Engineering was a natural follow-on from a, call it an innate interest in mathematics. It was the wanting to do something applied and physical in the real world rather than purely theoretical, because it could have gone that path and done you know, purely theoretical physics or pure math. And it was more, get your hands dirty, do something, build something, make something with it and then be creative in a positive way with that. So that led to engineering. And then 
then it becomes, okay, what are the hard problems? What's a really hard problem? And a lot of the problems we face today in systems, they're really hard because the systems are really complicated. It's systems of systems of systems. Yeah, it's, uh, it's turtles all the way down. But honestly, as we grow even linearly, the attack surface increases, the vulnerabilities. Look, what you're doing right now around IoT security and getting down to the chips, I've watched you go back down the rabbit hole, you know, not just to ring zero, but into the hardware. And I've watched you find out what are those base building blocks on which everything else is tethered. Was that intuitive to you to do that? Just keep digging deeper and asking why? Or was it something you picked up along the way? Was there a point in your life where you say, now I'm applying this to the world of technology? So there was a, call it a trigger point for this. Around the, so if you look at the architecture of a mobile phone, like especially smartphone, they had a really big problem to deal with. You know, the old dumb POTS phone where you could send a text and, you know, play very basic games and not do much more, mm-hmm. didn't have the same problem. As soon as they decided, hey, let's put in an application processor as well. And let's put in this really funky environment that's kind of like a desktop where you can install software. It's like, oh, but wait, we have this problem with this radio. Oh, how do we keep these separated? Oh, how do we update and manage these? All of a sudden, this turned into, this is a network device, but unlike the internet connected PC that you probably have, whatever that is, there's a billing function involved. And think back to analog handsets. Remember all about cloned handsets? Yeah. <laughs> and your, your phone bill skyrocketed through the roof. It's because the entire, the entire foundation of that system had a giant hole in it. And it's kind of like the way PCs were built when it came to, say, oh, trashing the BIOS, installing the ransomware. Now, fast forward, and we're building you know, connected systems that perhaps shouldn't be connected. Guess what? They have the same problem. It may not be a billing function, but the integrity, reliability, operational security, manageability, the whole nine yards, it all needs to be taken care of. And it starts with the fundamentals in the silicon. You know, it's back to the foundation. Yeah, it's ironic. When we were trying to actually get on the call today, I think the first thing you tried was VoIP. And then you're like, okay, so now I'll try a handset. Eventually, you went back to, was it a 92 phone that you're now dialing in with? Yes, a 1992 analog hardwired handset that just works like a charm. Built like a brick, worked like a charm. It's 28 years later and it's still going strong. Yep. I know we went to Queens University, which is phenomenal for engineering. And you've got the ring on your little finger for it. You weren't doing security then, or maybe you were. Maybe fundamental engineering is not all that inseparable from security. But you were also into photography. I know that. Did you meet Rita around photography? Is that am I? That's correct. Yeah. So how does photography factor into this, you know, chemistry of fill? Uh, complete off switch. You go into the dark room, you pull out the film, and you're, exactly. you're in a zen place. It's a creative place to go that's not instant gratification of a digital camera that most people would go for. So I cut my teeth doing black and white and photography is still when I, you know, obviously have digital camera and they are unbelievable. You know what I mean? You want instant quality and photos that that can't be captured other ways. Digital, you know, it's there. Mm. But for something that is a complete off switch and a throwback to a different world where you turn it, turn all the digital stuff off, no phone, no nothing like that, go work with film. And it requires patience, requires thought. You have to see the light, if you know what I mean. (laughs) And then it's off to the darkroom to apply techniques that were lost in the 1930s. And the results, there's more black and white film available now than there was, say, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. The results are stunning. But I think that's a... There's a rhythm to your life. I'm going to play a pop psychologist and you need to tell me I'm a way off base or riff on it. I've known you, you love nature. You live very rurally. I've seen you under stress being like, I have to go solve a technical problem. And there's this, there's this dark room as well, which is that Zen happy place. But I've seen you at the other end of the spectrum. You have a high EQ as well. And you're very intense in the engineering and working with teams. In fact, I, Every team I've ever known you form or be part of has been a team of amazing people, literally. You know, this, most companies, they have like a super coder out of 10 or 20. You build teams of super coders. Is that an oscillation in your life? Because you go very intense and frenetic and then go back to the calm zen. Is there a rhythm to that? Is that a part of your makeup? 
actually think about it and they're both the same thing. They both mm. require hyper focus. It's so true. They both require hyper focus. So disappearing into the dark room, it's intense because you have to concentrate for a long period of time to get the product. Working on a, a hard technical problem, it's a long period of time focusing. And working with a team, there's interactions involved, but it's still a long period of time because it's like trying to conduct a symphony or you're in the middle of the symphony trying to play with them. And it requires focus. You have to pay attention. So let's talk about maybe paying attention and, and Signal 9 solutions. In late 95, early 96, I think, if I remember rightly, you read an article about a really stupid break-in, a digital break-in, a hack. And you're like, that's silly, that can be solved. And that led to the company that I joined. It was my first job out of college. And we actually competed against the likes of interest in those days in PKI and asymmetric encryption. And we really set out to build the first symmetric key-based VPN and solve some of the very soluble problems and put much more robust security in place. Was that the moment that you really became a security person? Was it before or after that? And feel free to correct my memory here because, you know, it's not perfect either. So I had worked previously in a place, an environment with high security requirements. Mm -hmm and got a lot of insight into the operational world where the standards were extremely high and seeing like, why did they do what they did and what were the requirements of the types of information they needed to protect? And then seeing, okay, they already have this connectivity problem. How, why do they have it? Okay. Understand their environment. And then now we're bringing, you know, it's the broadband rollout phase and everybody at home is going to have connectivity of some sort. Initially, it's you know, dial up and then you see DSL cable moving forward to fiber, wireless, whatever. And it's like, this thing is just going to go nuts. It's just going to be insane because the security is not being considered. The mature organizations that already had established networks internally, they were already dealing with this. How do you make that maturity and bring it to the masses? So this would have been... Early 90s, late 80s? Yes, yeah. early 90s. Early, early 90s. 90s. When I, so an, another employer in Ottawa, uh -huh. so back, at, back at National Defense. Yeah, understood. And right around when you would have visited me in Boston, and I would have taken you and Rita on a tour of, of Boston as a, only a, an, a fellow expat could do, probably around that time frame. But prior to that, you'd work with my dad at, at Bell Northern Research in Nortel. I've never asked you what it was like working with him, by the way. And that team seemed to me as then a, a teenager, it seemed like a phenomenal team. It was incredible to drop by and meet you guys sometimes. What was that like? That was a brilliant team, Sam. I mean, off the wall, brilliant. One of the team members gone on is now the head for basically Microsoft Research at the Cambridge Lab in the UK. Mm -hmm. He's the, the person behind Sphere. So he, he went on, yeah, no, he brilliant, brilliant guy. The energy in that team was unbelievable. There was probably no problem that couldn't be solved because you had multiple disciplines at your fingertips to go to lunch with and bounce ideas off of. And it was, a, I wouldn't say an academic environment because there were always the, call it the, you know, the corporate objectives or the team objectives or the deliverables that we had for whatever product we were working on or adding features to. But in terms of the approaches that we could take, because there was no... Nobody had invented this stuff yet. Mm -hmm. So turn back to the days before synopsis and cadence. And, you know, everybody takes for granted now that there's billions and billions of transistors, you know, on a CPU or on a chip. And this is back in the day when a company could be vertical and had to build a thing from scratch. Those synthesis yeah. tools didn't exist. And we were literally inventing this stuff. And the theory, you know, the theory for the, the mathematical theory for how to even optimize the problem or verify that it worked, that hadn't been done yet. And you were working with the people who were pioneering it. It was unbelievable. You had people who had been through the academically rigorous, and they were scientists, and they were engineers, and they were, almost all of them were, were Renaissance people. I mean, they were people that had you know, spoke multiple languages and were classicists. And it was a phenomenal group to drop in as, as a teenager and just say hi to everybody. Oh, it was very cool. <laughs> There's this precocious kid hanging out with you guys, but... Later at Signal 9, I think I want to focus from Signal 9 forward a little bit. So I think the next milestone was the personal firewall. 
And do you remember the debates, the insults we used to get about how there's no such thing as a personal firewall from academics? They were like a firewall is defined as a barrier and control system that routes between networks. What you are doing is heresy. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. Why would you do that on an endnote? It doesn't make sense. What do you need that for? <laughs> we went to a government show and someone said, I want to telecommute. I think they said they wanted to come in from like Petawawa, which is way out in the sticks, right outside of Ottawa. And we were like, cool, we'll, we'll drop a VPN server in for you. He goes, no, no, I want to use a Windows 95 box. And I think we just gave him blank looks and said, you want to do what? Do you remember your thinking in the development of that personal firewall? Yeah. Well, the first one was kind of clunky because it was all mm -hmm. manual, but we had to start somewhere. And it sold. It sold a lot. Absolutely did. There were people who loved it because you could turn every knob and fine grain tune the thing. And the, de the default settings were brilliant. It was sort of, you know, ratchet everything down so that I can do, you know, get enough done to get enough done and then set it more into a promiscuous mode and go from there. It was pretty cool. I think the statute of limitations has run out now on violating a Microsoft license, but we did reverse engineer the drivers, right? The Endis Endis WAN drivers there. We did, and we probably didn't have to because it, by that point they had published what the APIs look like. It was that they just hadn't, fit, they just didn't have an intercept mechanism. Mm -hmm. And we built one and it ran in, I think, less than 100K of memory, might be less than 80K of memory, and it, it screamed. Yeah, it was tiny. So we sold that and you and I moved to California and we went to McAfee. And actually, for a bunch of reasons we probably shouldn't go into around McAfee's then management, we went slightly different ways, but we stayed in touch. Your career path after that here in the US was remarkable. Can you maybe just a couple minutes on on what big sort of steps you went there? Because you went to the Seattle area and you did some really big things. Correct. So I wound up working at what's now, or then, may still be now, called Boeing Phantom Works. And I was brought in, they actually gave me a special title and called me the chief security researcher. And what my job was, was basically to work with several teams on, call it security related stuff whether it was from content management through to deep learning and knowledge acquisition on enormous data sets or what you would now call AI or machine learning. So this is looking for, oh, you know, if people think in terms of, you know, network penetrations and low and slow scans. And we were, because we had this enormous amount of traffic from the company and a giant target, we had access to the material to do very in-depth analysis of what's happening on a network and then model out the complexities of systems and then step back and go, okay, so what are we going to do with this? How do we use it? Can we build a, a predictor or analytical tool around that? That happened. Um, that was successful. And then in terms of, you know, larger problems in an operating environment where say you have contractors and consultants and the intellectual property management of building a complex system, you know, whether it's a document or, whether it's physical plans or whether it's, you know, how do you attach an engine to a wing? Mm. How do you manage the information that, you know, who gets to see under what conditions or work with or what operations can happen based on some environment? It's just very, very cool. And again, a team of surrounded by, you know, brilliant PhDs from around the world, just unbelievable group of people. I have to ask two questions about that, just because it's a great time to do it. And when we normally talk, we either talk about how things are today, we talk about business around uh, Sequitur Labs, your current company. The first is, because of you, I met a gentleman in Canada who later became a bit of a mentor to me, and he passed away quite young. It was uh, Robert Garrigue. And um, he was a submariner in the Royal Canadian Navy. He was a lieutenant commander. And he later went on to be the CISO for Manitoba, where he once told me, Remember, Sam, much is expected of those to whom much is given. And then he went to be the CISO for the Bank of Montreal. He was doing work in the 90s on this kind of large-scale network. And he, I think he was even looking at like insect models for hacker behavior and human behavior online. Did you ever work with him on that? Or did any of that influence this? Or was that just completely separate? Because I actually met him through you. No. So the work that, that was actually his PhD. And what he did was actually uh, studying... It was ants, I think, wasn't it? Or was it bees? Honeybees. Ants. Honeybees, it was it was bees, and what he was looking at sort of the bees colonization and the resilience of a bee culture to get through some sort of catastrophe, and how do they do it? How do they act? Like how do bees respond to an attack? Mm. So he was looking at that. It was pretty cool. That was actually it was super cool. 
Yeah, no, I read a couple of papers that came out of his PhD. He was outstanding. I remember I asked him once, I said, well, why would anything evolve, by the way, to have a defense mechanism that has the individual die? And Because why would some species be sting and the result was their death? And it's where I came up with the idea of the hive effect and why communities are so important. Because after a certain point, you get more for your DNA's continuance from the hive than you do even from your own continued existence, which is an interesting examination of altruism. But going forward from there, did you apply some? The second question was, did you apply some of this outside of Boeing? You know, every now and then you would, we would talk when you were there and then you'd pop up and say, I'm working on a really big case. I can't discuss it, you know, with law enforcement, for instance. And it felt like your work on the one hand was actually affecting how people were really analyzing the criminal behavior on the other. Am I inferring too much or was there a connection there? If you can. No, there's absolutely a connection. And it's an oversight that we have. If you look back to network connectivity, we sort of got to the point where we thought, well, you know, we can do deep pack inspection. Everything can be controlled at the network layer. And it was sort of a, you got there because you got there and that's what you knew at the time. And that's the way you're thinking about the system or the network and connected systems. It's all about the network. And it's really not. And that was a lesson that I was learning at that point at Boeing was it's not all about the network. Systems are layer upon layer upon layer of stuff. Think of the ISO diagram or, you know, seven layer, nine layer, 27 layer at this point, yep. probably back. Yeah, seven layer dip. Mm -hmm. Great. And think about, remember the I diagrams you drew in physics in high school? Yeah. Right. So there's some observability problem. And if you put the I in the wrong place, you couldn't see what was happening. Yes. The old optics eye. Yeah. Exactly. You have to put the eyeball in the right place to see what's going on. And in a complex system, what you need to do is actually instrument at multiple layers. So you put an eyeball in every layer, and then you figure out what the relations are between call them, the different abstractions at the different layers. We'll call them, what do the different eyeballs see, and how do you pull that together? Because that gives you the vision and what is going on inside of the system. In other words, it has to be instrumented. The sensors have to be placed in the right place to give total visibility. The work with DOJ was actually a situation just like that because multiple systems had been compromised. Looking at any one of them did not give a picture of what was going on. Pulling the aggregate together of the information we had from, say, messaging system, financial transaction system, an auction system that was automated, a payment system, pulling all of that together basically revealed, oh, ha, huh, it's a fully automated money laundering scheme. Wow, who would have thought that? <laughs> yeah, and then actually getting the guys, right? I won't make you say anything or try to even make you say something you shouldn't, but that lesson of putting eyeballs at every layer is huge. And it was behind my own thinking earlier this year when I was looking at privacy and, and privacy enhancing technologies uh, with Dr. Alon Kaufman. We looked at, at, we called it the ghost in the machine, right? How, what should we be doing on ingestion on, with processing and with output for a bunch of reasons, everything from social justice to and fairness to uh, getting the right kind of actionability and data in the system and doing it responsibly. Where this popped up for me originally was with automated driving systems. You know, someone said, hey, the automated driving system had an accident and we don't know why. I'm like, we well, don't know why with a Mark I human being. And at what point does the result have to be good enough that you'll accept it? But I think we could make, I won't call them AIs, let's call them progressively deeper machine learning. We could build it in that way where we can do traceability and we can break apart what is currently becoming kind of a, an opaque box. Do you agree with that? It is possible to get to the point where you have a system that's adequate. And this comes down, so same problem that exists with aircraft. What's the measure for adequate? What's the level of safety that needs to be achieved? We're still learning about the complexity of, say, autonomous vehicles. They are unbelievably complex. I had some actually some really interesting discussions with people who lead in the development of the, the hardware, software, firmware, even the LIDAR for autonomous vehicles mm -hmm. at some European car manufacturers. And it's harder than the aircraft problem, which are pretty much fully autonomous mm -hmm. because the aircraft can move in three, they have three degrees of freedom. I mean, and slightly less traffic for the time being, yeah. Exactly. A car can't. And a car doesn't know the difference between a log on the road and a human. So, from that perspective, the vehicle is a more difficult problem, but a lot of lessons could be learned from aviation and applied, but it has to be scaled because the car will probably wind up with more computers in it than an aircraft. Yeah. I mean, boundary conditions notwithstanding, there's something like, call it 
I don't know, 40,000 deaths on highways right now in the U.S. At what point do we say it's good enough? Is it 4,000 deaths instead with autonomous vehicles or 400 or four? It's a tough question, I think. And I have no idea how the legal system will interpret it, but I do want to shift gears. We're getting close to the end of our time. So I've got really a question or two left for you, Phil. I think I understand you went all in on security or security went all in on you here because all along, it wasn't really a separate thing. Your methodology is about understanding the depths of a system and all the layers of abstraction, which is a good term, but also about how to make them do the right things, how to make them behave in ways that are more functional, more usable. So my question is this, if if you were talking to a young engineering student who for some reason likes film and darkroom today, what would you say to him or her if they want to go and be deep in technology and maybe pursue security? What advice would you give that, that person? So the first step was really to make the decision of wanting to do something positive and creative. For them, it's learn, keep learning and ask questions. So, you know, take all of the knowledge that they would say, you know, what they obtain becoming an engineer. How do they apply that? You know, there's a set of ethics or an underpinning to being an engineer of get it wrong and bad things happen. Do it sloppily, bad things happen. Be good at it. And you always have to be a student. Keep learning, keep learning, keep trying. There's always the next thing to be done. And then always step back and look and go, is this the right way of going about it? Or if you could change something that we're doing because it's just not working the way we're doing it or we just keep adding to it and it, the building's going to fall over, how do you do that? And then how do you make that happen? Excellent. Well, we didn't have time to talk about anything like, you know, what books you might recommend or about whiskey or any of the other things we've talked about and done over the years. But Phil, thank you so much for being on the show. And I'm looking forward to when, certainly this may date the show, but when the pandemic and quarantine are over, coming back to Washington State and seeing you and Rita or having you uh, come out to Boston sometime. So thank you very much. Hey, many thanks. Appreciate it. Take care. Cyber Reason is the champion for today's defenders, providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Cyber Reason and cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash CISO stories.